Welcome to EM Rapid 2023. Myself, Dr. Naveen Mohan, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Amrita School of Medicine, Kochi. So let's discuss acute limb ischemia today. So what is acute limb ischemia? It is defined as any sudden decrease in the limb perfusion causing a potential threat to the viability of the limb and that's usually by a thrombus or an embolus. Acute limb ischemia usually refers to patients presenting with symptoms for less than two weeks. Less than two weeks. The spectrum of acute limb ischemia ranges from a few hours history of a painful cold white leg to a few days history of short distance claudication or it may be a sudden increase in the ischemic symptoms on a background of already existing peripheral arterial disease. The risk factors for acute limb ischemia include hypertension, smoking and diabetes mellitus. So acute limb ischemia is a surgical emergency and without surgical revascularization, complete acute ischemia results in extensive tissue necrosis within 6 hours. The pathophysiology The most common cause of acute limb ischemia is acute thrombotic occlusion of a pre-existing stenotic arterial segment which accounts for almost 60% of the cases. Acute thrombotic occlusion of a pre-existing stenotic arterial segment. But the second most common cause is embolism. Around 30% of the cases can be attributed to embolism. For example, a left atrial thrombus in patients with atrial fibrillation accounts for around 80% of the peripheral emboli. Other causes for embolism could be a mural thrombus following an MI or from a prosthetic heart valves. So these embolus lodge in a blood vessel in another part of the circulation causing occlusion of the blood vessel like here. So distinguishing these two conditions are important as the treatment and prognosis are completely different. Emboli can also arise from proximal arterial disease, either aneurysms or stenosis. And in such cases, it may contain atheroma. And if it contains atheroma, if the emboli contains atheroma, they carry a very poor prognosis for the limb since they are harder to treat and not amenable to thrombolysis. So, th thrombosis may be influenced by any of the factors described in virtuous triad. I've already discussed virtuous triad in previous session on uh, deep vein thrombosis. It comprises of stasis, endothelial or, or vessel wall injury and hypercoagulability. The, the phenomena of interrupted blood flow stasis, the risk factors include long surgical operations, prolonged immobility, varicose veins. An endothelial or vessel wall injury includes injury or trauma such as vessel piercings, damage arising from shear stress or hypertension, biomaterials of implants, medical devices, etc. And the hypercoagulability could be because of risk factors such as hyperviscosity, coagulation factor 5 laden mutation, coagulation factor 2 G2021A mutation, deficiency of antithrombin 3, protein C or S deficiency, etc. So let's discuss about the other rarer causes of acute limb ischemia. This table has been taken from Arkham Learning. So this is one cause, vasculitis, then popliteal entrapment syndrome, compartment syndrome, iatrogenic causes, aortic dissection, graft occlusion, even Raynaud's syndrome. So vasculitis, inflammation of the arteries. In such cases, you'll have to look for whether the patient has got a bilateral disease, whether the patient has got systemic symptoms such as fever, malaise, and whether he has got other signs of a connective tissue disease. 
to rule out a popliteal entrapment syndrome. You should know that the popliteal artery is compressed by the gastrocnemius during plantar flexion, and usually it's uh, seen in a young man uh, after a uh, heavy exercise. That is about popliteal entrapment syndrome. These are very very rare causes. Then comes compartment syndrome, which means swelling of tissues within the facial compartment, especially the anterior compartment of the leg, which compresses the artery. So, in such cases, always look for history of trauma. Is there pain on passive movement of the foot? Then comes iatrogenic causes of acute limb ischemia. If there happens to be an injury of usually the common femoral or superficial femoral artery following catheterization, uh, usually seen in uh, recent coronary angiograms, then it could, it could lead, to, lead to acute limb ischemia. Then one deadly cause is aortic dissection. Usually a patient presents with back pain, hypotension and changing signs, example uh, palpable pulses over time. So here what happens is the dissection flap may occlude the true lumen of a branch vessel causing end organ ischemia. So you'll have to so in your in your history and examination you'll have to address all these things. Okay, and one by one you'll have to rule out. Right? Then comes graft occlusion. That means thrombosis of the graft, especially if prosthetic rather than vein. Then here you'll have to ask for a history of previous vascular surgery. Always look for scars. The severity of ischemia will depend on how quickly it has blocked. The previous stenosis may allow collaterals to develop. So in your history and examination, you will have to ask or address all these things and rule out all these causes. Vasculitis, popliteal entrapment syndrome, compartment syndrome, iatrogenic aortic dissection, graft occlusion. For that, you need to take a proper history and do a proper examination. So let's discuss the difference between a acute limb ischemia caused by an embolus as well as a thrombus. An acute limb ischemia caused by embolus, onset is usually acute, happens over seconds to minutes, whereas in thrombus it will be insidious over hours to days. Ischemia in acute, in, in case of embolus, usually is prolonged because there is no collateral circulation but in case of a thrombus ischemia is less severe because there are several collateral uh, vessels there is collateral circulation is there and hence this less severe than that of an embolus in case of embolus there is not usually a history of claudication and pulses are usually present in the other leg whereas in case of a, a thrombotic occlusion there will often be a history of claudication and pulses in the other leg may also be present in case of embolus the skin changes of the feet for example marbling and all may be visible and this can be a fine reticular branching or mottling in early stages progressing to coarse fixed mottling whereas in a thrombotic occlusion skin changes are usually absent so this is how you identify embolus from a thrombus by the history the clinical change history as well as clinical examination so the examination findings usually we always talk about the six p's that means pain pallor paresthesia paralysis perishing cold pulselessness and the classical signs the six p's may be attenuated in patient with a already pre-existing peripheral arterial disease and with collaterals and in all such cases arterial dopplers should be performed okay so whatever the clinical if you suspect any of these things the acute limb ischemia you should always do a, a doppler exam arterial doppler examination so the pain in acute limb ischemia ranges from acute onset short distance claudication to rest pain and uh, it may be relieved on dependency if the, by hanging the legs over the bed and aggravation on act, passive movement of the muscles indicates potential compartment syndrome. So this has to be ruled out. The compartment syndrome always has to be ruled out by doing a passive movement of the muscles. Then comes pallor. Acutely ischemic limbs are classically white rather than blue. 
and chronic critically ischemic limbs may appear pink due to the compensatory vasodilatation the so called sunset foot sunset foot and in this situation the burgers test may also be helpful that means pallor on elevation of the limb with erythema on dependency that is the burgers test and about paresthesia it is paresthesia is present in over 50% of the cases and sensory nerves are more sensitive to ischemia than motor nerves so tend to be affected first then about paralysis if paralysis is there it means it's a very poor prognostic sign and indicates an element of irreversible ischemia paralysis and perishing cold this is a useful sign if used in comparison to the opposite normal limb then about pulselessness checking the pulses is notoriously unreliable so in all such cases to a arterial doppler so arterial doppler signals should be checked in anyone with suspected acute limb ischemia and audible arterial doppler signals do not eliminate the diagnosis of acute limb ischemia so always think about pain pallor paresthesia paralysis perishing cold pulselessness always think about acute limb ischemia so examination findings this is the diagram the arterial tree of the lower limb you can just go through it a full cardiovascular examination should be performed to detect cardiac arrhythmias or possible valvular heart disease as a source of emboli and also the abdomen should be assessed for the evidence of abdominal aortic aneurysm this is important this is one thing most of the doctors miss always rule out a abdominal aortic aneurysm so on the affected leg once history taking is over proper history has been taken then you will have to uh, do an inspection palpation auscultation all these things so under inspection of the affected limb affected uh, leg look for color white color suggests acute ischemia a fixed mottling of the leg is a poor prognostic sign and implies irreversible ischemia chronically ischemic legs may appear pink or blue dry gangrene is also a late sign and consistent with chronic irreversible ischemia patients with classical emboli have a white leg with a normal leg on the opposite side in patients with thrombotic occlusions the signs may be more subtle since collaterals may have formed due to pre existing peripheral arterial disease then look for any scars on the leg look for scars of previous surgery surgery on the abdominal aorta may be uh, via midline or transverse incision patients who have had a endovascular vascular abdominal aneurysm repair will have scars on the groin and do not forget behind behind the knee patients who have had a popliteal aneurysm repair may have a vertical scar behind the knee so this is about the inspection aspect color scars we want to the palpation always as always you look for temperature always compare to the opposite leg check for pulse pulses determine whether the patient has a palpable femoral pulse or not check the capillary refill time check for any limb tenderness tenderness again is a poor prognostic sign as it suggests muscle ischemia check for pain on passive movement if that is there it suggests compartment syndrome and that requires immediate vascular referral for urgent intervention and always check for neurological function test both the sensory as well as the motor function okay test both sensory and motor loss of sensation is common loss of motor function is a poor prognostic sign and any neurological deficit implies the need for emergency intervention so you have to go systematically history inspection palpation auscultation auscultation you always do a handheld doppler for all patients with suspected acute limb ischemia to look for arterial flow and always compare these to the opposite leg also we'll be doing a angle brachial pressure index abpi 
to help assess the severity of ischemia when the Doppler signals are audible. So what is ABPI? It is the systolic pressure in the pedal arteries divided by the brachial artery pressure. So you can, a manual spigmomanum BP uh, apparatus is placed around the lower leg and inflated until there is no audible pedal Doppler signal. The cuff is then slowly deflated until the arterial Doppler signal is audible and this is the ankle pressure. And the brachial pressure is also measured in the same way. So ultimately, the normal expected ABPI is ranged from 1 to 1.2. But for patients for having claudication, we'll have ABPI from 0.6 to 0.8. And patients with critical ischemia, defined as rest pain or tissue loss, usually have an ABPI of 0.2 to 0.4. Diabetics may have falsely elevated ABPIs due to calcified incompressible arteries. So it's essential to fully examine both legs. The comparison between the normal and the abnormal leg will often aid both diagnosis and determining probable etiology. So the classification. The purpose of the history and examination is to determine three things. The, the major three things. Is the leg acutely ischemic or is there an alternative diagnosis? Is the likely cause embolic or thrombotic? Is the leg viable, threatened, or irreversi irreversibly ischemic? So these questions have to be answered. This is the ultimate purpose of taking the history and examination. Is the leg acutely ischemic? Is the likely cause embolic or thrombotic? Is the leg viable, threatened, or irreversibly ischemic? The answers to these three questions will determine the immediate management. So this is Rutherford's classification of acute limb ischemia. It is divided into class 1, 2A, 2B and 3. So class 1 means it is viable. Class 2A, it means the limb is threatened but salvageable if promptly treated. Here, the sensory, uh, there will be partial sensory loss, probably in the toes only or there, they, there may not be any sensory loss also. In case of class 2B, it, mean, it also means threatened, but here it is salvageable with immediate reconstruction. Here the sensory loss will be partial, that means more than the toes. Sensory loss will be more than the toes or there, there will, it will be complete sensory loss. But the major thing to be noted here is there will be partial paralysis. The motor aspect, there will be partial paralysis. And when it goes to Class 3, it is irreversible. It means there is major tissue loss or permanent nerve damage is inevitable. And here there will be a profound paralysis, rigor or profound uh, anesthesia. So this is, this is important because this questions have been framed around uh, this table, especially in MRCM and FRCM SBAs. So the sensory motor deficit helps identify limbs in need of urgent intervention. Fixed staining and profound paralysis are signs of irreversible ischemia. So in class 2A, there will, only be, there, there will not be any paralysis. But in class 2B, there will be partial paralysis. So the differential diagnosis, the compartment syndrome, it occurs when the pressure in, increases within a facial compartment, which compromises the blood flow and can result in tissue necrosis. Once the intracompartmental pressure is greater than the arterial pressure. And compartment syndrome presents with severe pain and tenderness in the affected compartment associated with pain on passive movement of, of the muscles and later neurosensory loss also. The treatment of compartment syndrome is fasciotomy to release the muscle and this should be performed following reperfusion if there is any question of compartment syndrome. So the other differential diagnosis will be a cerebrovascular accident. Here the thing is, although the limb may be pale, cool and paralyzed, it should not be painful and the Doppler signals should be audible. And then about deep vein thrombosis. Here the leg is usually warm, pink, swollen and tender. Okay, 
warm pink swollen and tender in phlegmasia cerulea dolens a dvt can cause venous gangrene i have already uh, discussed about that in previous topic uh, lecture on deep vein thrombosis the foot usually appears blue purple or black the arterial doppler signals should be audible phlegmasia cerulea dolens should also be referred to a vascular specialist immediately and then about hypovolemia this is very common in the emergency department patient will be in shock and shock can present with pulseless limbs but here an accurate history and examination should clarify the diagnosis the thing is all the limbs will be affected you will not be able to feel pulse in any of the limbs in hypovolemic shock then about acute compressive neuropathy can present with a paralyzed limb and here also doppler signals should be normal so the learning bite is that arterial doppler examination and an accurate history should differentiate acute limb ischemia from other common differential diagnoses investigation strategies in acute limb ischemia will have to do an ecg to diagnose atrial fibrillation or other cardiac arrhythmias or another acute cardiac event which may be a source of emboli ultimately the thing is we'll have to find out the source of emboli so do an ecg do an echocardiogram to look for la clot do a uh, ultrasound scanning for uh, of uh, aortic femoral and popliteal artery the blood tests relevant to the suspected acutely ischemic limb are listed here full blood count to detect for hematological disorders predisposing to thrombosis i've already discussed the virtuous triad no? so they rule out the hematological disorders predisposing to thrombosis the urea and electrolytes patients are often dehydrated and potassium may be raised if muscle necrosis has occurred glucose to screen for diabetes creatinine kinase it may be raised if muscle ischemia has occurred clotting time it is rare to detect clotting abnormalities but it is usual to check before pre prescribing heparin because that is a treatment then grouping and cross matching and all because patient may have to undergo surgery as always pre operative investigations then arterial blood gas analysis to look for acidosis secondary to ischemia and if uh, the patient is acidotic the most initial uh, important initial management is rehydration and about imaging the urgency of imaging depends on the presentation conventional imaging consists of a digital subtraction angiogram so this is an invasive procedure using intra arterial contrast but the potential for therapeutic intervention thrombolysis and angioplasty mr angiography and ct angiography are less invasive and should provide the same anatomical information arterial duplex is non invasive but is an operator dependent and iliac and calf vessels can be difficult to image the choice of imaging is likely to depend on the local resources available so in ed the initial management will be analgesia oxygen heparin iv fluids and referral to vascular surgery so analgesia there is no specific analgesia for ischemia but anticipate the potential for high analgesic requirements particularly if there is an element of uh, compartment syndrome in which disproportionate pain to the clinical appearances of feature so iv opiates are likely to be required as part of a multimodal approach and patients with limb ischemia are likely to be vasculopaths nsaids may increase the risk of myocardial events and should not be used routinely and neuropathic pain may sometimes be associated with critical limb ischemia then all patients should be administered supplemental oxygen then heparin 5000 international units of heparin unfractionated uff should be administered given immediately to all patients with acute limb ischemia even if they are likely to be undergoing surgery or angiography so this is basically to prevent propagation of the thrombosis in patients in whom definitive treatment is deferred an iv heparin infusion should be prescribed then about iv fluids so patients with acute limb ischemia are often dehydrated 
and in addition they are likely to be undergoing surgery or being given iodinated contrast which will be a further renal insult and the reperfusion of ischemic tissue releases toxic metabolites potassium creatinine kinase and myoglobin which can further damage the kidneys and the administration of potassium should be avoided so that is the rationale behind giving iv fluids and ultimately always refer to a vascular specialist urgently any delay risks jeopardizing the limb particularly if there is a sensory motor impairment so this is about initial management in the ed so the definitive management is usually done by the vascular surgery this is based on rutherford's classification this is where rutherford's classification is important so in category 1 it means the viable limb all these patients with a viable limb and you are suspecting uh, acute limb ischemia they should be admitted given analgesia and oxygen and heparin infusion and the formal imaging angiogram mr angiogram ct angiogram or arterial duplex uh, should be done depending on the local resources uh, to plan definitive treatment then about then about uh, category 2a uh, means that the patient have a threatened limb okay but they can wait so they should be given oxygen analgesia heparin as, as in category 1 and ideally they should have an immediate imaging in order to guide uh, operative or intravascular intervention all these cases you'll have to do an either operative or intravascular intervention but in some cases where there is a minimal sensory loss only where there is only a minimal sensory loss uh, they may be managed conservatively overnight and imaging obtained the following day okay this is about category just look at the previous slides in which i have mentioned about rutherford uh, classification then about category 2b so these patients have a threatened limb and cannot wait overnight so they need urgent revascularization either operatively or with thrombolysis the imaging may be acquired while the patient is in the theater so category 2b means urgent revascularization either operatively or thrombolysis so in a patient with a clear history for embolus and the source of embolus is identified and the normal contralateral limb an embolectomy may be performed under local anesthesia and in all cases an anesthetist should be present to manage the patient medically during the procedure following the revascularization the limb may swell and the need for fasciotomy should be, should always be considered then about category 3 these patients usually have irreversible ischemia and the limb is not salvageable here the options are either amputation or palliation here revascularization attempt should not be done because that may cause a reperfusion syndrome which causes multi organ failure and death so this has to be understood so you can for exams you may get several uh, clinical scenarios in which patient will have paralysis and stuff like that so you'll have to identify under which category the patient is is it, is it under category 2a or category 2b depending on the clinical features you'll have to identify and depending on that you'll have to uh, advise your treatment so about thrombolysis provided the patient does not have any of the contraindications thrombolysis such as bleeding or severe bleeding tendency pregnancy recent cva intracerebral tumor av malformation surgery less than 2 weeks previous gi bleed less than the trauma less than 10 days ago in all such cases intraarterial thrombolysis is an alternative treatment to surgery for the acutely ischemic limb so intraarterial streptokinase or uh, tissue plasminogen activator convert plasminogen into plasmin which lyses thrombin so following thrombolysis an angiogram should be performed to identify an underlying stenosis and interventional radiology approaches include mechanical thrombectomy so there is no evidence to favor thrombolysis over surgery in the acutely ischemic limb so about acute upper limb ischemia it is much less common than acute leg ischemia about 20% of all limb ischemia is usually due, due to a cardiac emboli since atherosclerosis does not usually affect upper limb vessels and more rarely it can be due to emboli from a subclavian artery stenosis in such cases look here look for uh, subclavian brew okay and vasculitis and thoracic outlet syndrome can rarely cause an acutely ischemic arm the commonest sites of occlusion 
in upper limb are the axillary and the brachial arteries. As for patients with lower limb ischemia, if there is no neuromuscular impairment, patients can be admitted and heparinized overnight. Patients with signs of sensorimotor impairment should proceed to surgery. This will usually consist of a brachial embolectomy, which can be performed under local anesthesia. However, occasionally more extensive procedures are required. The initial management follows the same principles as for acutely ischemic leg, oxygen, analgesia, heparin, all these things. And the patient should be referred to a vascular specialist. The problems and pitfalls. And there's something called as a popliteal aneurysm, uh, which tend to accumulate thrombus. So because of their position behind the uh, knee joint, this can dislodge and embolize to the foot. So alternatively, the aneurysm may occlude due to a thrombosis. And any patient with suspected popliteal aneurysm and ischemic symptoms, even if the, it is, these are only, only mild, should be referred urgently to a vascular specialist. Because acute limb ischemia due to thrombosed popliteal aneurysm carries around 50% risk of amputation. So this is important, popliteal aneurysm. So then palliative care. Acute limb ischemia may occur as a preterminal event. It is important to recognize this because in order that a patient who is dying may be managed appropriately and spare futile interventions. And bilateral limb ischemia is more difficult to diagnose because both legs are abnormal. And this may be caused, caused by a saddle embolus, a diotic bifurcation, which carries 30% mortality. Or it can also be because of a abdominal aortic dissection. But here in this case, I've already mentioned in previous slides that they present classically with back pain and hypotension. So these things have to be borne in mind. Popliteal aneurysm, saddle embolus at the biotic bifurcation if it is bilateral acute limb ischemia and uh, also about uh, ruling out abdominal aortic dissection. So the key learning points in this session are the acute limb ischemia carries a high morbidity and mortality. Few patients present with simple embolus without underlying peripheral arterial disease. The classical signs of acute limb ischemia may be attenuated in a patient with underlying peripheral arterial disease due to the development of collateral vessels. And all patients with suspected acute limb ischemia should have arterial Doppler examination performed. Arterial Doppler examination. All patients with acute limb ischemia should receive analgesia, heparin, oxygen. Analgesia, heparin, oxygen. An assessment of sensory motor deficit helps determine the urgency of intervention. So this is very important, sensory motor deficit assessment. And patients with no or mild sensory loss should proceed to formal imaging, usually angiography, prior to intervention. Patients with motor deficit may proceed to theater for intervention with on-table imaging. Patients with fixed mot skin mottling and complete paralysis have signs of an unsalvageable limb. And in these patients, revascularization is dangerous and the choice is between amputation and palliation. There is no evidence to support the use of thrombolysis over surgery in the management of acute limb ischemia. Beware the patient with a popliteal aneurysm and history of acute limb ischemia. A thrombosed popliteal aneurysm carries 50% risk of amputation. So this is all about acute limb ischemia. Thank you.